Hi, beloved. I'm Mother Miriam, Mother Miriam of the Lamb of God, the Lamb who took away the sins of the world and mine and yours. Um, we are on our uh, last segment, as we do today, where the world does not believe in God. A great part of the world has turned from God. Our civilization is becoming more immoral by the day. Uh, it's getting pretty scary out there. Our religious freedoms are being taken away. So much, beloved, and yet God doesn't want us to hide. He wants us to be his witnesses in this very world that has turned from God so that they may know him. We cannot keep what God has given us to ourselves. And so we think of the men who have gone before us and the women and who have died for their faith as great, great saints, great heroes. We could never be like them, but beloved, we are them. We are like them. They failed like us, they sinned like us, but like us through grace, they put their trust in a very great God who absolutely cannot fail. And so last time we looked at Abel and we looked at Noah and we looked at Enoch. And today we'll look at Abraham and his wife, Sarah. We have to get a woman in there. And so in chapter 11 of Hebrews, which I've said is the hall of fame of faith of Old Testament saints, lists all of them, how they lived, how they died, how they pleased God. And following their example is just, um, it's a gem that we have this spiritual treasure to follow. And um, the writer of the Hebrews says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, the men of old received divine approval. By faith, we understand that the world was created by the word of God, so that what is seen is made out of the things which do not appear. And then he goes on to describe the faith of Abel and the faith of Enoch and the faith of Noah. And today we're gonna to begin at verse eight, the faith of Abraham. Abraham, the writer says, the writer of Hebrews writing to those first century Jews who were the first Christians, by faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place which he was to receive and his inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was to go. God said, Abram, I want you to come out of there. Come out of Earl of the Chaldeans. Come out from among your family, even your parents who are idol worshipers. Come on out from them and I'm gonna bring you to a land you don't know. And so Abraham took his little nephew Lot and he started. Where are you going, Abraham? I don't know. What's your forwarding address? I don't have one. How do you know? Well, why are you doing it? Because God said, you see, Abraham, he had faith. And, but his name was Abram, A-B-R-A-M, which meant high and honored father. And God would change Abram's name to Abraham, which meant a father of many nations. And he promised Abraham two things in Genesis chapter 12. Uh, I'm not gonna go there because it will take too long to read it. We won't have enough time. So I'm just gonna tell you what those two things are. He promised Abraham an inheritance, that he would inherit the promised land and a formation of a mighty, mighty people more than the stars of the sea, more than the grains of sand would be the people that would come from, from Abram. And so, um, uh, many, many things God promised Abraham, but Abraham never ever saw the fulfillment of God's promise. He never um, saw the formation of a mighty people out past his own sons, and he never stepped foot in that promised land other than what it took to bury, to, uh, to bury his wife. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age, and she considered since she considered him faithful who had promised. When I first read that, I said, now, wait a minute. What's Sarah doing in here? What's Sarah? Sarah was married to Abraham, but so was Hagar. And well, Sarah was formally married to Abraham, but she couldn't give him children. Remember that? So she sent her handmaid, Hagar, to have relations with Abraham, told Abraham to go to Hagar. And together, Hagar and Abraham bore Ishmael. And then Sarah became very jealous and she threw Ishmael out. What kind of faith is that? And then she had, when the, when the angel came to Sarah and Abraham, told them that they would, Sarah would bear a son, she laughed, she laughed. 
And then the angel said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? And Abraham said to Sarah, why did you laugh? And she said, I didn't laugh. Well, she did laugh. First she laughed and then she lied. Actually, Abraham was 100 years old and Sarah was 90. I would laugh too. But is anything impossible for God? But the fact is, where is her faith? Where is her faith? None of those failures. Abraham's failure, none of it is in Hebrews 11. Sarah's failures, none of it is in Hebrews 11. How come? How come? You know how, and if we had time, I would go back and tell you about Abraham and Sarah. I was shocked when I started reading scripture on Abraham and Sarah. In my Jewish faith, I didn't even know all that they did. And when I started reading through it, I, I blushed for shame. I said, why did they do all that? Why would they publish it? Why would they spread out people's dirty laundry for the world to know? I was so upset. But then I figured, you know how parents, Hebrews 11, it's none of it. They're set up as saints in here. None of their failures are in there. You know what I thought about? You know how parents, as parents, you put uh, stickers on the back of your ch car, my child is student of the month, and you put all their awards, their little drawings and everything up on your refrigerator, all the little certificates, good report cards, all on your refrigerator with magnets. And you know what I decided? Hebrews 11 is God's refrigerator. That's what it is. You don't display your children's failures, and they are God's children. And he displayed what was true. He just left a few facts out because it's his refrigerator. And he delights, he delights in his children, absolutely delights. And it's not that Sarah had no faith. It's not that she had no faith. She probably had the faith that said, it's just too good to be true. It's too good to be true. I would bear a son at 90 years old, she said. It's too good to be true. I feel that way, beloved, about myself being Catholic now, being a Jewish nun, being Catholic and being a religious, getting to wear this habit, getting to be a sign of hope for the world. It's too good to be true, but it's true because nothing's impossible with God. Someone wrote, it's an anonymous person, I don't know who it is, but they said that thou should think, thou shouldst think so well of us, and be the God thou art is darkness to my intellect, but sunshine to my heart. I love it. I love it. They went through many trials and many famines and many failures and many wars. Some they passed, some they failed. But there was never a trial so great as that on Mount Moriah. God said to Abraham, rather, take your son, Abraham, your only son, it's estimated Isaac was early teenager by then. Take your son Isaac, your only son, the son of promise, the son through whom, your seed through whom all the nations of the world would be blessed, through whom the Messiah would come. Take that son, the one you love, the one you give your life for, and kill him. And there you have the picture in Genesis chapter 22 of Abraham and Isaac walking the mountain. And they have the wood and they have everything. And Isaac says, Papa, Papa, we got the wood. We got, where's the sacrifice? And Abraham says to Isaac, God will provide. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. And they got up to that mountain. I could see Abraham being awake the night before, begging God to take him instead of Isaac. But he obeyed God. And they got up to Mount Moriah, and they set up the wood. And then he tied up Isaac and put him on the wood as the sacrifice. And Abraham had his knife up like this to kill his son. When he heard a voice, Abraham, Abraham, and Abraham said, here I am. And he said, don't kill your son, Isaac. And Abraham put the knife down and God told him that there was a ram stuck in the thicket behind him that would be Isaac's substitute. And Isaac lived. And don't think that Isaac ever forget, forgot the example of his dad who loved him. Isaac didn't doubt that and yet at the cost of Isaac's life, which would have killed Abraham too, he would put him to death to be faithful to God. And Isaac would never forget that example. And it was a foreshadowing, beloved. It was a foreshadowing of the one who would one day give his life for us, the Lamb of God. There was a ram stuck in the thicket for Isaac, but there was no ram stuck in the thicket for the Son of God who died and who rose again to give us life. 
The book of Hebrews speaks of what is better, better than the law, better than all that went before it, something better. And he said, look what your forefathers have done because they believed God and we have so much more. We have so much more. And so the writer to the Hebrews says this finally. He says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, so many heroes of the faith, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And the picture of our running the race and letting everything go is the picture of a person being chased by a big bear. You're on the way to the airport, you've got a couple of big bags of luggage, and all of a sudden you're chased by a bear or a wild lion or something, and you've got to get through the gate. And in order to get through the gate and save your life, you've got to drop your luggage, because all that matters is your life. And you drop your luggage, all your possessions, and you get through. That's the idea. Run the race that is set before setting aside the sin that so easily besets you, the stuff that weighs you down, the stuff will prevent you from going into heaven. Do the saints, beloved, all that we've been through these last two talks, these three talks, do the saints have lives worth emulating? Through all their days, they were strangers and pilgrims in a foreign land, and so are we, beloved. Augustine, St. Augustine says, I can give you many quotes, but just one. We are sojourners. We are exiled from our fatherland. That's why we pray, Hail, Holy Queen, Mother of Mercy, our life, our sweetness, and our hope. To thee do we cry, poor banished children of Eve. We're banished from our fatherland. To thee do we cry, to thee do we send up our sighs, mourning and weeping in this valley of tears. Turn then, most gracious virgin, most gracious mother, thine eyes of mercy toward us. And after this, our exile, we are in exile on earth. Show unto us the blessed fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Oh, beloved, we are citizens of heaven. We are citizens of heaven. And our entire life here is as saints en route to being saints in heaven. We are becoming what we are, but fully becoming what we are. Um, oof, there's so much here. I'll just give you one example, one little story of a woman. She was a, a um, cleaning woman, and she was in a large office building late at night, and everybody was gone, but there was a light on in one room at the end of the hall. And she went down there, and she saw a huge block of marble and a man sculpting the marble. And she went around to see what he was sculpting, and she was staring at it as he was chiseling away. And all of a sudden, she recognized the head of Abraham Lincoln. And she said to him, oh, Sir, how did you know Mr. Lincoln was in that rock? How did you know that? You see, beloved, God looks at us. He sees his son. He sees Christ. And he'll chip away and chisel away everything that is not his son until we awake in his very likeness. Someone, what wrote this, someone wrote this, doubt sees the obstacles. Doubt sees the obstacles. Faith sees the way. Doubt sees the darks of night. Faith sees the day. Doubt dreads to take the step. Faith soars on high. And doubt whispers, who believes? Faith answers, I. Believe, beloved, he is yours, he loves you, he gave his life for you, and he who has began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ. Don't run from trials, run to God, gives them to you that you might be molded. There's a little, little song I used to sing to the inmates when I was a jail chaplain, and it went, he loves you just, the way you are today, but much 
too much to let you stay that way. And when he's changed your life from what it was before, he still won't love you one bit more because he's a God of love, beloved, and all you need to do to be loved is get in God's way. Okay, have a wonderful sleep. Make sure you're in God's way and know that you are loved. God bless you.